Now, in this last part of the lecture, we're going to talk about the diversity of reptilia, excluding, of course, birds, because they're going to be covered in the next lecture. So we're going to talk about these different uh, reptile groups, and I've drawn one of the other groups that's not represented in the phylogeny in the textbook, uh, tuataras, just because they're super cool, and I want to talk about them as we move forward. Now, there's lots of non-avian reptiles. There's roughly 6,000 species. They tend to be terrestrial. That is, they're mostly away from water, though there's some aquatic forms as well. And they have a diversity of feeding forms, including a lot of carnivory. So you can see some pictures here uh, that I took the two on the left. So on the upper left, you have a lava lizard from Galapagos that is feeding on a cockroach. On the bottom, you have a lava, lava lizard from Galapagos that's feeding on a... Lava lizard. Cannibalistic. Lots of lizards can be cannibalistic. On the upper right is a picture that a colleague of mine, Rowan Barrett, took of a snake in Quebec that's eating a uh, frog. The first group that uh, we can talk about within uh, the reptiles, the non-avian reptiles, is Testudinia, which is the turtles and the tortoises. Now these have been very similar in form for almost 250 million years. You can see lots of fossil uh, turtles that look just like modern turtles, although sometimes way bigger. Now they have this dorsal and ventral bony plates that form a shell. This was a dead snapping turtle that we found on the road. And you can see on the inside the extension of the ribs and their migration from a developmental perspective uh, out to the surface of the animal uh, to provide this protective sheet. Most of them are aquatic, like the Galapagos sea turtle on the upper right there, uh, but you also have um, a lot of terrestrial forms too, in particularly tortoises. Now, if you remember, with amphibians, they basically all needed to lay their eggs in the water. But now you have amniotic eggs, which cannot be laid in the water. So even reptiles that are almost exclusively marine, such as sea turtles, but also sea snakes, they still have to come on shore to lay their eggs now. So you've been afforded the opportunity to get away from water, even during reproduction, but now you cannot be in water during reproduction. So here are just some pictures that I've taken of Galapagos tortoises, three of them, and then uh, a marine turtle that's burying its eggs in the upper right. The next group I want to talk about is the crocodilia, which is sometimes called archosaurs, particularly by taxonomists. These include uh, the crocodilians that would be crocodiles, caimans, gharials, and alligators. On the lower left, you have this really cool cluster of caimans that I saw in the Brazilian Pantanal, and the upper right, um, a American alligator from Florida that I saw just before COVID lockdown, like literally a week before. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, the crocodiles because I want to talk more about Lepidosauria, which is another group. Now, this is a very diverse group that includes the squamates, which are the lizards and snakes, but also this cool thing called tuataras that resemble lizards, but they're not uh, in the evolutionary uh, part of the tree that represents lizards itself. Let's start with tuataras. Now, tuataras are a um, lizard-like old branch off the reptile tree and they're found only in New Zealand. They're highly endangered because when mammals became invasive within New Zealand on the mainlands of New Zealand, they wiped out all of the tuataras. So tuataras are now only found on uh, small islands off the coast of uh, the North Island mainly. Now, they're nocturnal, they don't have external ears like some of the other reptiles do, and they have a well-developed parietal eye. They're not the only thing to have a parietal eye, but it's really well-developed in the tuataras. This is kind of like a, a, a third eye, and it's mainly thought to sense um, just a general amount of light, and that is linked to photoperiodic schedules, such as um, your day-night cycle. Now, this squamate group, uh, is quite diverse. And so once you get outside of the branch from the tuataras, here are a bunch of the different groups that are represented by a more modern phylogeny. On the top there, you have geckos, which I'll talk about as we move forward. Uh, and then you have skinks, amphisbanians, which I want to talk about. You have the snakes, and then you have a bunch of the lizards on the bottom. 
So it's a very complex phylogeny with a lot of variation going on. So the lizards are the biggest and most diverse of these groups. Here's just some pictures of lizards that I've seen. Uh, this is an Italian wall lizard that I saw in Croatia, right beside Italy. Uh, on the lower left is a, um, a lizard in Panama that my daughter saw. She was like, oh, look, look, Dad, Dad, a lizard. And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm looking, I don't see it. I'm like, oh, honey, it's just, it's just not a lizard. She's like, no, 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 it's a lizard. And I'm like, oh, honey, I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. That's great. It's great you think it's a lizard, but it's not a lizard. And she says, no, Dad, it's a lizard. And so I'm like, oh, 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 it is a lizard. Oh, cool. Sorry. Sorry. You're right. It's a lizard. Um, and uh, they, lizards can go from very, very small uh, to very large, such as Komodo dragons that get to three meters long and will kill large mammals. Now, one of the interesting things about lizards is that there are at least 32 separate evolutionary instances of the loss of legs. So you have tons of legless lizards. If you grab something that looks like a snake, a lot of the time it's not a snake because lots of different branches of reptiles have lost uh, their legs. And I just uh, found this recent phylogeny which just shows a bunch of the different instances in which squamates have lost their limbs. So on the bottom you have the snakes which don't have limbs at all except for little vestiges of them that you'll see later. And then here are some of the other origins of the loss of legs. So there's lots and lots of loss of legs in squamates. One of my favorite reptiles is the marine iguana in Galapagos. Uh, they were talked about by Darwin and um, uh, Herman Melville when he visited the Galapagos and everybody writes about them because they're so dramatic. And I've got some cool video in the introductory materials about marine iguanas including showing how they swim through the water and talking about how they feed. Uh, and there's my daughter and uh, happened to be snorkeling through a pool in Galapagos and a marine iguana swam right, right up to her. And on the lower right, uh, you have two males that have been fighting and they're all bloody because they've been fighting for territories and for access to females. Another squamate group that's super cool are the geckos. And you saw my daughter talking a bit about them in the introductory video. Uh, and I'm uh, giving this part of the lecture right now, but I'm waiting for her to get home so I can try to show you one of the super cool things about geckos. This is one of my daughter's geckos, and it is perched on a vertical surface of glass, which is really hard to hang on to. But they have these uh, very tiny hairs called setae on their feet, almost microscopic, that essentially form electron interactions with the surface that they're clinging to. So it's like uh, instant Velcro, in a sense, in a molecular way. And there's plenty of biotechnology innovations and inventions that are inspired by various properties of gecko feet. In the introductory video, I got all excited telling you about these Amphisbanians I'd never seen before until in Trinidad at one point we saw them and I showed you a video of them. Now they're one of these things in which limbs has been lost and they look uh, at least crudely like snakes. So you can uh, see the one there that was in the video introductory video. Uh, they don't have legs except in this one group uh, called bipes that have a little bit of legs left. They don't really have uh, eyes anymore. They're very reduced and you can see in the video and in the picture there they have very small eyes. Uh, and they don't have ear openings anymore. Also their scales fuse until they form rings around the body. Also there's a picture of the skull on the lower right there and they're basically like a little wedge that's used for moving underground, and in fact, Amphisbanians spend most of their time underground. I think the reason we saw them in Trinidad after all these years is that you had a really wet period and they'd come out and were moving around, possibly for reproduction. Of course, snakes are really amazing uh, part of the squamate groups. They don't have limbs, with an exception of sorts that you'll see later. And they have this incredible uh, replication of vertebrae, up to 200 vertebrae. In fact, when you finally get to McGill, you can see in the Red Path Museum, where my office is, uh, we have an anaconda on display. They also have this highly kinetic, which means movable skull, such that they can swallow very large objects, like eggs or deer, if you're a big snake. Uh, and they can extend their jaw and basically dislocate it and swallow things that are much bigger than their head. They also have a cool organ called a vomeronasal organ that I'll tell you about a bit later. 
It's not just snakes, it's found in other organisms too. For instance, it's also found in horses. So you'll see sometimes horses will raise, raise up their upper lip, and that's because they have uh, bits of a vomeronasal organ as well that they're using to sense various compounds in the air. Then another form of smell, if you will. In the introductory video, I brought you into my wife's breeding room, uh, ball python breeding room. And the cool thing about ball pythons, one of the cool things about ball pythons, is they show incredible color variation. And so here are a series of pictures from very early on in my wife's ball python breeding operation. And you see there's an incredible diversity of color pattern, color intensity, and color itself. And so we thought that this would be a really cool way to study the genetic basis of color and pattern variation in animals in general. And so in collaboration with Rowan Barrett, another professor in the Red Path Museum, and one of your TAs, Alan Garcia Elfring, we set out to study the genetics of color variation using my wife's ball pythons along with other ball pythons. And we just released one of the papers, uh, preliminary work finding a particular mutation that seems to be responsible for one of the color patterns. If you're at McGill, I would bring in ball pythons for you to come down after class and look at. Here's past classes with students uh, holding Nagini, which is our um, designated training ball python, teaching ball python. Can't do that now. But what I can do is I can bring some ball pythons out and I can record new video of me showing you some of the cool features of ball pythons using my wife's ball pythons. So let's do that now. So let's see if I can make this work. So there we go. There are those heat sensing pits on the side of the head, which sent, sense infrared. And they use that to detect mammals or birds that are going by. There's cool videos of rattlesnakes hunting at night in the pitch black using these infrared uh, pits on the side of the head. So snakes, even though they don't have four limbs, are tetrapods in evolutionary sense. And you can still see some little elements of that tetrapod ancestry in the remnants of the pelvis. They're called these pelvic spurs. So let's see if we can spot them on this. Uh... So you can see right there, the little bit of remnant of the pelvis. Now that is not attached to the spine at all. It's simply floating there. And actually they retain some function in ball pythons because males use them during mating to some of the time uh, aid their holding on to the female during the long period in which they're in copulation. And look at that. Now you have one where you see the heat sensitive bits and the pelvic spurs in the same one. Look at that. That's so cool. Now the reason why you would shed is to get rid of uh, old and damaged skin or parasites on the external part of the skin and also because it aids growth. The way this works is that in the process of shedding, lymph is released underneath the old layer of skin and above the new layer of skin, which then gives the skin sort of a milky appearance. It is in the beginning of a shed and you can see how it's a bit dusky and milky. You see, you can see the eye is a bit milky. Again, you see the beautiful uh, pits on the side of the head. So this snake will shed in a little bit and then be bright and fresh with its new skin. So you can see on any given snake shed, the imprint of the different types of scales that are on the side of the snake. The perfect imprint of the eyes. Is it the classic, of course, forked tongue of snakes? Now what they do is they take that forked tongue and they use it to sense gradients in chemicals. And then they bring them back to the vomeronasal organ that uh, has two pits in the inside of the mouth. Anyway, snakes, super, super cool. Uh, and I'd like to thank my wife for letting me take her snakes out and turn them into teaching tools. Okay, so that's it for today's lecture on reptiles. Uh, the next lecture is going to be on birds, which are one of the branches off of the reptiles. Here's a cormorant that got out uh, in Florida and just walked right up on a turtle and uh, crowed its happiness on top of the turtle.